you to all of you for joining us tonight. This is the second in our environmental justice conversation series. Uh, last week we heard from Nathaniel Smith with the Partnership for Southern Equity who kind of laid the foundation, I think, for a lot of what we're going to be talking about for the rest of the series. Uh, but tonight I'm delighted to welcome Dr. Nataki Osborne-Jelks from Spelman College uh, to speak on on environmental health inequities and the impact of the climate crisis on vulnerable uh, populations. Um, Nataki is, is amazing, uh, kind of truly a scholar activist in all of the best ways. Um, she currently, like I said, teaches at Spelman College where she's an assistant professor, um, has an undergraduate degree from Spelman College and a PhD from Georgia State University, as well as a master's in public health from Emory. Um, and, and her work, I, in fact, I got to know Nataki working on a totally different subject, uh, which is amazing to me because it's very rare, you know, I feel like in, in the academic world and in the kind of activist world, two people sort of specialize and, and you know, do the same type of thing over the course of their career. Nataki does not do that, and, and I very much appreciate that. Um, I got to know Nataki from her work on water, and we're going to be hearing from the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance, where she was one of the co-founders. Uh, later in our series on their work in Proctor Creek and, and kind of West Atlanta. Uh, but yeah, tonight, just really delighted to, to welcome Nataki to talk about um, the, the newest piece, I think, of, of the work that you're doing, which is on climate and heat inequities here in Atlanta. And um, she's been doing amazing work to really map out, uh, you know, heat inequities across the city, figure out who is, you know, suffering from those, and then um, find ways to mitigate that. For, for vulnerable communities in our region. So really delighted to welcome Nataki, uh, and, and yeah, thank you for being here. Inviting me to be here uh, and for getting everything set up. And uh, as, as Will said, uh, we met, because uh, he was doing some uh, history work, oral history work uh, on water issues in Proctor Creek and all of that. Uh, so it's been also great to to see him kind of transition into some other things. Um, but what's always really fascinated uh, me is his, you know, work as a, a public historian and, you know, the work that he's done to really raise a lot of, you know, critical issues about uh, environmental challenges uh, in the South uh, and Southeast. So I appreciate, uh, again, the invitation to be here tonight. And so I will talk about heat. I'm just kind of starting uh, at a broader place, and then I'll end um, with this work that I've been doing on heat lately. So um, if you could go to the next slide, that would be great. So um, my training is in environmental health. Uh, so I want to use kind of a health frame to start this out. Um, and kind of talk a little bit about the health effects of pollution. So as we think about climate change, pollution is uh, partially fueling that. Um, we think about a lot of the impacts, you know, from heat to um, extreme weather events uh, in terms of, you know, more intense storms. We think about hurricanes and superstorms and uh, lots of, of things that have been uh, experienced across the country. Um, but we've got to take it back to this extractive economy that we have, um, as well as to the pollution generated from that extractive economy. And so if we kind of think about Georgia, um, what I think some people know, but perhaps some people don't know, is that um, Georgia is home to three of the dirtiest, uh, largest and dirtiest coal plants uh, in the country. And in fact, when there were um, you know, changes and updates to the Clean Air Act, and there was pressure being put on industries to, you know, clean up their act. Um, you know, we are, you know, one of the states, you know, when you look at the South, uh, these were some of the areas where you had sort of a grandfathering in of some of these coal plants who didn't have to immediately move to, you know, putting scrubbers on their smokestacks and things like that. And so from this health perspective, we think about children. Um, I think a lot about who are the vulnerable populations. So a lot of times we're thinking about children, we're thinking about the elderly, uh, we're thinking about pregnant women or those who are trying to become pregnant. Um, and then those who live in closest proximity, live and work in closest proximity to these types of facilities are those gonna, who are going to be at highest risk uh, from a health perspective. Next slide, please. 
um, when we think about those the impacts of air pollution um, on on health, and this slide is kind of focusing in on children's health, um, but it really impacts the health of us all. Um, interestingly enough, as we are, you know, still ho hopefully, you know, kind of moving, you know, out of um, a lot of huge concern about COVID in terms of the severe cases um, and the hospitalizations and deaths, um, there were some studies um, that were um, that have been released over the past a couple of years that have identified the fact that those who are living in populations where they have been um, exposed to air pollution, fine particulate matter uh, from air pollution, you know, over time um, have had um, more uh, severe cases um, with respect to COVID and also had a greater risk for hospitalization and death. Um, because of that long-term exposure to air pollution. And so when we think about children, we can think about um, lots of things from childhood cancers to uh, low birth weights um, to early births um, to, you know, uh, impaired lung functions, et cetera. Um, so when we think about how we're exposed uh, to this pollution and, and those, again, who are most vulnerable, um, that hopefully, you know, is giving uh, folks an impetus to try to, you know, figure out what we can do, you know, about climate change. And there's a lot of emphasis um, at a lot of different levels uh, from the community level um, to uh, nonprofit organizations and even government agencies. Um, I'm encouraged by the actions that um, President Biden um, is taking and is, you know, trying to implement. Um, but, you know, a lot of this has been, you know, really long overdue. Next slide, please. Um, we also have to think about, uh, again, kind of following this theme of children, um, you know, the, the dirty school buses that many of our, our children, you know, ride and the exposure to diesel, um, partic particulate matter from diesel fuel. Um, there has been a push um, as of late to get more electric school buses. Um, I know Fulton County um, has a kind of pilot um, in terms of an electric school bus. Um, EPA uh, and some other federal agencies were making grant funding available um, just earlier this year um, to try to um, increase the number of electric school buses in school districts across the country. So that's something that's very needed. That's definitely, from a transportation perspective, one of those uh, areas where there still needs to be a lot of work done. Um, and, and then, you know, we could also really think about um, the need for uh, greater connectivity, transit connectivity uh, in places, you know, like Atlanta um, and other, you know, urban centers. Next slide, please. But so beyond that pollution, and there are lots of impacts from exposure to pollution, we've got to think about what those climate change connections and risks are as well. Um, so as we move beyond just thinking about how that pollution is harming us, we have to also think about um, the greenhouse gases that we're producing in our everyday activities from, you know, uh, using electricity to um, the trips that we make in our vehicles. Um, these are all things that are contributing, you know, to the greenhouse gases, you know, to um, how our energy is being produced. All of these things are all connected. Um, and from a climate change perspective, this is causing things like hotter temperatures, um, more intense and extreme weather events, um, as well as rising sea levels um, and impacts to coastal communities. Next slide, please. Uh, climate change connects to many different health outcomes, and so this is probably difficult to see um, from where you all are sitting, but it talks about, um, you know, kind of those climate change drivers, you know, human exposures to things like pollution, um, to things like, um, you know, these extreme weather events. Um, and at the end, in terms of health effects, we're talking about temperature-related, you know, illnesses uh, and even death. Um, we're talking about extreme weather-related health effects, uh, air pollution, um, and the impacts on respiratory health, um, water and foodborne, you know, diseases. All of this is connected to climate change. Um, you know, we can think about also, uh, you know, water shortages and drought and how that's impacting our food supply, um, as well as how um, our, our crops can also be impacted um, by um, increased precipitation um, as well. So lots of lots of things. It's not these relationships are not necessarily linear. In some places or parts of the world, you can have, you know, the um, intense storm events uh, that have their effects. In other places, there might be extreme drought. Um, you know, out west, we've definitely seen the wildfires. Um, so not necessarily linear, linear relationships, but different types of impacts. And when we look at 
um, data uh, and reports coming out of um, groups like the uh, Intergovernmental you know, Panel on Climate Change, they really have signaled that you know, this is kind of code red for humanity. Um, we're already experiencing impacts. Climate change is not something that we're going to experience in the future. It's here, um, and the impacts are being felt uh, in a very widespread manner. Uh, and certain groups are more vulnerable than others. Certain groups are being impacted more than others, and we can see that uh, in the United States. We can see that locally, and we can also look at that from a global perspective. Next slide, please. Uh, impacts of climate change and health, and this is really, you know, um, it, it does, um, you know, repeat some of the things of, of the last slide, but it, you know, also kind of brings out, especially from a global perspective, things like malnutrition, um, things like diarrheal disease that are related to, you know, contaminated water supplies, um, forced migration. Um, we've seen that in, in the United States. So we're still here in the Atlanta metropolitan area, and I don't know what the count is now. Um, but we, we still have lots of folks who migrated to Atlanta um, after, you know, events like Hurricane Katrina um, and after some of the other um, hurricanes that have happened since then. So we've seen that here locally. Uh, definitely it's happened, you know, um, across the world. Um, it's increased conflict in some areas in terms of, um, you know, access to, you know, limited resources and, you know, people fighting over that. Um, so there are all sorts of impacts. Um, you know, uh, infectious diseases, you know, as well, um, respiratory uh, illnesses, allergies, asthma. Um, so you name it, there are lots of health effects that are associated um, with our um, exposure to these climate drivers. Next slide. Um, this um, slide is kind of looking at um, how our health is uh, harmed by climate change. Again, probably can't see it very well, but it's break breaking up different regions of the country um, to look at, you know, where, um, what some of these climate impacts, you know, uh, are currently and are projected to be in the future. Um, so in the south and southeast that are kind of grouped together, um, you've got um, uh, outdoor air quality um, as an issue, extreme temperatures. Um, you've got some of the vector-borne diseases, you know, associated with uh, infectious diseases, et cetera, um, and a host of other um, a host of other uh, health impacts. One of the health impacts also um, listed here for the South and Southeast um, that where folks don't talk about as much um, are our mental health effects. Um, you know, how are people coping, you know, with what's happening? Um, and I'll just mention that uh, Jennifer Barkin, who is a researcher at Mercer University, um, is working specifically on a scale to look at um, how people are being impacted mentally by climate change. Um, and she has started her work looking at what's happening to women and children um, and, um, you know, what sorts of mental health uh, impacts there are um, because of, you know, the situations that we find ourselves in, um, you know, the impacts um, experienced in different communities, et cetera. Next slide. When we look at the Atlanta area or Atlanta proper uh, in terms of the top climate hazards, this is what is um, the, what the modeling is showing us um, in terms of uh, between now and 2050, what we should expect. Um, so we should expect increased precipitation, increased warming, um, increased water deficit, um, you know, drought, as well as heat waves. Um, so these are all of the things that we have to look forward to, so to speak. Um, but hopefully we'll continue to have this local action, you know, happening um, across the metropolitan area um, to, to try to, you know, slow some of this down. Next slide. You can. Um, is it, was that severity or like frequency? This is more um, frequency. Th those were things more frequency, so more of it, um, and not necessarily um, any sort of predictor on what, um, how intense. Well, actually, the intensity, if you could go back um, to that last slide. So actually... Um, so we're talking, um, the intensity is shown by the bars, uh, but just the fact that these are the things that are on the list are just showing what we're going to expect, you know, we're going to expect um, impacts in these areas. Um, but um, the intensity, um, and, and obviously, you know, this is not um, set up so that you can, you know, understand what the numbers are, but from a relative perspective, um, you can kind of see sort of where we are, you know, with precipitation, how that will grow, for instance, or where we are with warming and how that will grow. Mm 
Mm -hmm. Well, keep in mind that, um, you know, every year sort of brings different challenges. Um, just a few years ago, we did, we were in sort of a drought situation here in Atlanta. Since then, um, we've not had that, you know, had the drought or the water deficit since then. Um, you know, increasingly, we've had more flooding events. Um, so keep in mind also that we're in 2022. Between now and 2050, we can see any number of these things happening. Relationships, again, aren't linear, so some years might, you know, demonstrate or uh, we might experience, you know, um, some of this. Other years we might experience other things. Um, but between now and 2050, we're going to experience all of this, you know, per what the modeling is showing us. Good question. Next slide, please. Um, so next I just kind of have a few shots. This is uh, actually from 2009. This is the Mableton area. Um, so, um, and we've had, we tend to have a lot of localized flooding events. Um, every so often we're having these bigger events. Um, so before 2009, we'd had, you know, really if, uh, big events, especially in Atlanta in 2002. Um, so this was 2009. Since then, there have been localized flooding events, different, you know, subdivisions. In some cases, maybe apartments. Um, apartment buildings being flooded out. I know I live on the, the west side, and we've seen some of that as recently um, as uh, 2020 um, uh, and 2021. Uh, no, excuse me, 2020, um, just 2020. Um, so just uh, just wanted to kind of, you know, give you some, you know, sort of sense. You know, we don't think about this sort of thing, you know, as an everyday occurrence um, in our region, but not too long ago, this is what the, the situation was. Next slide. Absolutely. Yep. You're you're so right. You're so right. Mm -hmm. So back to that question of you know how do you reconcile drought and increased precipitation? Um, 2008 drought, 2009 flooding. Okay. Um, and so as we connect the dots, um, and I've talked about this already just briefly, um, when we you know talk about a range of air pollutants, including those greenhouse gases, and we're most concerned about carbon dioxide, um, but there are other greenhouse gases from you know other activities, human activities that we engage in that are also contributing uh, to the change in global temperatures. Um, and so this air pollution is kind of fueling uh, climate change, and there's this there's there's a cycle here. Um, and so with the with the climate change, um, we can expect those increased temperatures. Next slide. Um, and if we look at some data, this is just up through 2020, um, you know, uh, for Atlanta. Um, so you can see, you know, kind of um, looking at starting at 1970 and looking at this 30-year period, um, you have an increase in uh, spring, you know, spring days. And, you know, uh, from, from our own, you know, uh, enjoyment, you know, lots of times we, you know, we're excited about early spring and, you know, about the warm weather. Um, but, you know, what that is, it's signaling to us that our, our climate is changing. Um, so lots of more warm days. Next slide. Um, also, um, we've seen an increase. This just goes to 2018, and there's some more data that's kind of being crunched here. Um, but you see an increase in days above 90 degrees um, as well. Uh, and, you know, just interestingly enough, you know, last summer um, was, you know, kind of moderate. This summer, even before we hit, you know, summer officially, we were, you know, up in the high, you know, 90s. And then when you add that with factors around humidity, um, even if it wasn't, you know, kind of quite to 100 degrees, that humidity factor in some cases made it feel like that. Um, so we've seen, you know, more, uh, more days over 90. And you can go into the next slide. Um, and so with those warmer days, with more spring days, um, we're also seeing a longer allergy season. Um, so that's impacting those who are vulnerable um, to, you know, the, the range of pollen uh, in, in our community, you know, from uh, the vegetation that we have. And, you know, since Atlanta is this, you know, city in the forest, so to speak, um, it's come with, you know, a lot, uh, a lot more um, of those natural toxins. You know, we think about toxins naturally made versus toxicants, um, and they can all have an impact on health. And so, again, those who are most vulnerable um, in the context of allergies are, are kind of being hit um, a little bit harder in terms of um, this longer allergy season. Next slide. 
And so as we um, really think about climate change, um, I think we can all think about ways that we're all impacted. Um, but the thing to, to think about or to remember is that um, we're all in the same storm. Um, none of us are immune to the impacts or effects of climate change, um, but we're not all in the same boat. Uh, some communities, some populations are more vulnerable than others. Next slide. When we look at um, factors around vulnerability and especially how they impact things like health outcomes, um, we can look at exposure, you know, contact, um, you know, with toxicants, for instance, um, exposure to extreme heat. Um, that is, you know, um, what we would consider exposure. Um, then we look at the degree to which um, you know, communities or populations are affected. That's a factor around sensitivity. And then is there um, the ability to adapt? Um, we hear the term resilience a lot of times, you know, the ability to be able to bounce back and to respond and for things to kind of go back to close to normal after there are, you know, climate shocks and stresses. Um, and the reality is that um, many communities are, have just been made to be very vulnerable um, because of things like um, systemic racism. Um, we've had a lot of racialized policies and housing, uh, housing segregation, uh, all of those things that um, really um, complicate the ability for some, you know, populations and communities to bounce back. Um, and many people even ask the question, do we want to just bounce back? Do we want to you know, strive for a little bit better than what the status quo is? Um, but all of these factors, you know, kind of feed into that vulnerability, um, which can, for many, lead to poor health outcomes. Next slide, please. This slide, I can't see it well, but it also is kind of talking about these climate drivers, um, exposure pathways, um, and it also kind of brings in this idea that we can be exposed to the extreme heat, but then there are overlapping exposures um, that build into this vulnerability. So things like poverty, um, things like, you know, uh, the racial discrimination, um, things like, um, you know, occupation. Um, you know, looking at, you know, maybe essential workers or looking at certain types of workers, those who might, you know, work outdoors, for instance, who are going to be more vulnerable. Um, so again, thinking about exposure. Um, also, in, in terms of thinking about that sensitivity, do folks have underlying health conditions that are exacerbated by exposure to these, you know, climate factors? Um, that's something to think about. In terms of, of that adaptive capability, um, you know, what uh, are people living in poverty? Do they have access to health care? Um, these are things that, again, are feeding into um, how these health outcomes manifest themselves in our populations. Next slide, please. Um, Atlanta, I'll mention, um, and I haven't seen any recent uh, data on this. I don't know that there has been a, a recent study, um, but several years ago, um, there was a study conducted um, that identified the fact that black children in Atlanta were four times as likely um, to have asthma than white children. Um, and they looked in the study, there were a number of factors that were looked at, like uh, residential segregation, like um, proximity to highways and highly trafficked areas, um, and those types of things. Um, what I don't think that study looked at were things like, you know, our tree canopy. Uh, and whether or not um, there was tree canopy, you know, in place to help mitigate some of those effects from an air pollution perspective um, and that sort of thing. Um, but as we think about, again, health impacts, we think about those who are most vulnerable, um, this is important. Um, also, I would just, you know, mention that in times at which we've seen um, you know, less impact and even, you know, things like uh, fewer emergency room visits um, for um, because of asthma and asthma attacks have been times at which um, public transportation has been, you know, heavily um, kind of promoted. Uh, so one time, which was really many, many years ago, um, was during the 1996 Olympics that were held in Atlanta. Um, so there was a, a huge emphasis on, you know, trying to have employers allow um, their employees to work, you know, flexible schedules. Um, there was some heavy emphasis on people using MARTA and public transportation because of the, you know, fear of all of the traffic that would be in place because of the Olympics. And so that was one year that we saw a decrease in those emergency room visits um, because a fewer people were, you know, driving during that time. Um, we've also seen um, some, you know, kind of um, 
improved air quality um, at the beginning of the pandemic when people were working from home uh, and were not traveling as much. Um, so at those times at which people had that ability, you know, to work from home or um, public transportation was was really promoted, um, we've seen some changes in some of those uh, in some of that data around our air quality and around um, you know emergent, emergency room visits um, due to um, you know asthma and other things that might be exacerbated by our air quality issues. Next slide. So in terms of you know climate change um, and, and air quality, um, we're looking at um, you know respiratory health related issues. So reduced lung function, uh, respiratory discomfort, um, exacerbation of chronic illnesses like asthma. All of these things are associated, you know, with exposure to air pollution. Uh, in addition to the things that I mentioned earlier, um, with respect to pregnant women and those vulnerable populations, um, and you know, preterm birth and, and all of those factors. Um, so these are all things that are connected to both climate change as well as our exposure to air pollution. Next slide. And so now I want to also talk about. Um, just um, uh, the South and Atlanta, um, I want to bring in a little bit of data and then kind of move into connecting this all up to heat. Um, so um, I um, grew, I have grown up on hip hop music um, as I've, um, you know, grown up from a teenager, you know, college, et cetera. And so there is a group uh, called the Goody Mob. Uh, some of you all may have heard of them. They had this song back in the 1990s um, that was called The Dirty South. And they had, there were a lot of political context um, to this song, um, you know, really talking about um, things around, you know, kind of drug enforcement and, you know, how people were being treated in certain communities. Um, you know, some of the, um, I guess, uh, in inequality around, you know, the policies, you know, around, you know, enforcement, you know, people um, caught with, um, say, crack cocaine, you know, more heavily penalized than people who were caught with cocaine, you know, kind of in its purer forms. Um, and so, uh, interesting, you know, kind of subtext here, but I think about that, that name, that moniker, the Dirty South, um, as I think about um, how the South, which is the Black Belt region, um, is one of the areas in the country um, where you have um, just a... Um, a disproportionate exposure to environmental uh, hazards um, and pollution generating sites, um, especially in black and other communities of color. Next slide. And so Dr. Robert Bullard, who is known you know, by many as, as the father for, of the environmental justice movement, and I'll say known by many because environmental justice as a movement really is decentralized, um, but he's acknowledged because um, he's a leading scholar, scholar activist even, um, around environmental justice issues. He's written, I think, something like 18 books around environmental justice issues, and he's got several books that are focused in, you know, focused on um, Atlanta. Um, I think one is Highway Robbery. Um, um, there's one on sprawl. I can't think of the name of it right now, but there are a ton of books um, and, and several that center Atlanta um, and some of the environmental justice issues here. And so he says, the South has a legacy of unequal protection. Um, why would the environment be any different? And in fact, the environment isn't different. When we think about all of the um, issues around injustices um, that permeate, that still permeate the South, um, the environment is, is one of those um, that's at the top of the list. Next slide. Um, and so in 2012, now I want to kind of bring it to Atlanta specifically. Um, so this is now 10 years old, um, but I still think very, um, very important. Um, there was a public interest um, legal organization called Green Law that no longer exists. Um, but one of the important things that I think they did, in addition to the legal work that they did on the ground, um, was to publish this study called the Patterns of Pollution. And so this looked at demographics uh, in metropolitan Atlanta, um, and it looked at you know the communities that were most vulnerable um, in the context of you know pollution sources. Next slide. So in this pattern pattern of pollution report. Um, they looked at a 14-county metropolitan Atlanta area, um, and they found that metropolitan Atlanta has 52 environmental justice hotspots. So the hotspots are...
environmental ju- ooh, wow. environmental justice cold spots uh, sorry about that um, and so these are the areas um, that um, are also of con- Yes. So, okay. So let's talk about it. So the hot spots. So an environmental justice hot spot is going to be defined as an area that has multiple pollution sources, but you also have overlapping social vulnerability. Um, so it's both the, there were scores developed. So you looked at the number of pollution sources, the intensity of those pollution sources. I take that back, not the intensity. Um, there are limitations to this. It doesn't really look at intensity, but it looks at the number of pollution sources in a particular area. And then it looked at overlapping social vulnerabilities. So you have communities of color, low income communities, maybe even language isolated communities. So these hot spots have, have both. Um, the cold spots are places that also have multiple pollution sources, but the communities might be more affluent, might have more resources to contend with some of that pollution. In some cases, I, I know from, you know, in past years, I used to serve on the uh, Fulton County Citizens Commission on the Environment. And so some of my colleagues on that committee were working, you know, living and working, you know, in North Fulton and where there were, you know, waste sites or landfills, you know, folks had they had you know the resources to hire attorneys and to try to get you know action you know taken against some of those polluters um so the cold spots are the places where you don't have the same social vulnerability um, but you do have um pollution you know multiple pollution sources um and while you can't see it well um will talked earlier about my work in the proctor creek watershed which is in northwest atlanta um part of the proctor creek watershed is listed here as the number four hot spots out of 52. Next slide. And so not only um, is that an issue, um, but, you know, historically um, in areas that have been redlined um, across the country, we are seeing, um, and this this was a study that came out earlier this year, um, they looked at, I want to say, 108 cities from across the country, um, and they found that historical redlining, so the areas that haven't received a lot of investment, uh, the areas kind of ranked, um, you know, um, kind of the lowest priority for investments, um, you know, in different cities across the country are those areas where we tend to see more pollution. Um, so here we're talking about air pollution in particular, um, but when we think about places like Atlanta and the Atlanta region, it's not just air pollution, um, but there may be you know water pollution issues as well. And I'll just mention in terms of these historically redlined neighborhoods, um, there was another recent study that came out that looked at um, several cities, and I know um, Atlanta was not one of these cities that top that was in the top ten per se, but also in these historically redlined neighborhoods, you had higher flooding risk. So again. As we're thinking about the different ways that climate change manifests itself, whether it's, um, you know, whether we're th- talking about the air pollution that's kind of um, contributing to climate change in the first place, or we're thinking about those hyperlocal impacts from climate change, like flooding, these same communities, um, especially historically redlined communities um, that are still, um, you know, more black and brown and more um, lower income than not are the areas that are most impacted. Next slide. Um, so when we think about kind of this unequal legacy, on the right, this is a, a map. This is Atlanta's uh, redlining map. Um, so it's kind of hard to point out things. Um, but I do want to point out the legend, if you haven't seen this before. Um, so the green areas um, are graded A. So the grades are from A um, to D. So the green areas graded um, graded with A, these are the places where, you know, um, it was deemed that you want, you know, are desirable to live in. These are the areas that are more white more affluent, Um, and as you move down the line, um, you get um, um, decreasing 
you know, quality, decreasing interest in investment. And in fact, you know, in these historically red line areas, um, this was a basis, right? The redlining um, was a basis to um, deny, you know, investments, to deny people, you know, loans um, to purchase homes. Um, it, it's also, you know, where development uh, has been denied until, you know, kind of recently. We're seeing, you know, uh, interest in these areas now, but you don't have, you know, the same level of tree canopy um, when we think about this in Atlanta as well as other cities. You don't have the same uh, investments or at least historical investments in parks and green space, you know, in these types of areas. Were you going to say something? 1937. So the Home Owners Loan Corporation, HOLC, um, was the government entity that developed these redlining maps um, from, you know, across for cities across the country. So these are 1930s policies that were ultimately um, banned and eliminated when you had things like the Fair Housing Act uh, that came into play decades later. But still, we are... Um, they had an indelible imprint on what is happening today. Policies from the 1930s that are no longer operational um, show up uh, in terms of the impacts. It sh they show up in terms of these vulnerable, these populations who I say really were made to be vulnerable because we haven't seen the investments. Um, we haven't seen, um, you know, the investments in infrastructure, you know, whether we're talking about uh, stormwater infrastructure or green infrastructure, um, you know, we just haven't seen it. You know, pollution control, um, all of those things. Um, and so um, I, I work at Spelman. Um, it's hard to show here, but Spelman, you know, our campus is located in one of these historically red line neighborhoods uh, on the west side of Atlanta. Next slide. Um, and so this, there was also, um, moving into thinking about these red line areas, there was a study that um, was published in 2020. Um, Jeremy Hoffman, who is at the Science Mu Museum of Virginia, um, led this study. And this, this, when this study was published, it kind of kicked off a lot of conversation and dialogue across the country about historically red line areas um, because of the connection to heat. Um, so they looked at the effects of these historical housing policies on resident exposure um, to intra-urban heat. Um, 108 urban areas were looked at. Atlanta was one of those cities. Um, where it was identified. Um, and this map here is kind of showing um, the, the dots, the yellowish green dots are showing the historically um, redlined areas that were included in the study. And so they found that these formerly uh, redlined communities um, see on average a temperature increase of, you know, almost five degrees Fahrenheit um, above those, you know, non-redlined neighborhoods. And so if this is an average, that means that some are higher uh, than this. Some might be lower, but definitely some are, are also higher. Um, so really important uh, to realize. Um, and, you know, the other thing that is kind of the subtext of many of these studies that have looked at these historically redlined neighborhoods is that um, we're talking about uh, places that have been historically redlined but are still um, mostly or primarily occupied by lower income and communities of color. Next slide. So um, when we think about um, you know, these areas, whether we're talking about redlined areas or just areas that are densely developed, um, we've got to think about the urban heat island. Um, and so part of the research that um, I started last year um, in Atlanta is looking at the urban heat island effect. And if you look at this, you know, simple um, graph, um, you can kind of quickly see um, what's being demonstrated here, uh, where you have rural areas or even suburban areas that tend to have uh, significant amounts of green space. Um, we're going to have cooler temperatures than our downtown, um, than the densely, you know, developed areas, you know, if we don't have um, mitigation strategies in place to cool down um, those areas that are hotter. So here you kind of see this peak in the downtown area. Um, and here in Atlanta, um, in terms of some of the data that has been collected, we definitely see, you know, um, so, some of the hotter areas are downtown or the neighborhoods that are in close proximity to downtown, including, you know, parts of the west side, including many of these historically red line neighborhoods where there hasn't been, again, this historical investment 
um, and the cooling, you know, natural cooling infrastructure, you know, like trees, like parks, like green space that can help to cool some of these areas. Um, so we know that the, ur the urban heat island effect is a thing. And so what we're trying to understand here in Atlanta is how much of a thing is it? Who is it most impacting? And ultimately, how can we work with those who are most impacted to develop strategies um, to try to mitigate some of these effects? Um, and we need strategies that are both, you know, short-term responsive, you know, strategies, um, and we need those longer-term strategies as well. Next slide. This is a, a quote from um, an environmental journalist who is doing a lot of um, coverage on um, extreme heat across the country. And so she says, we don't all experience heat the same. Those, uh, there are unhoused people who are left exposed to the elements. Uh, there are incarcerated people stuck in hot cells who can't advocate for themselves. And there are entire neighborhoods that grow hotter than others when temperatures rise. Um, and so this is the type of thing that we're trying to identify here locally. Um, we definitely know across the, the past two summers, we've you know heard about uh, the intensity of things in the Pacific Northwest. We've heard about the deaths in places like Phoenix. Um, so this is, you know, we've heard about um, severe illness in the Gulf Coast region and uh, in New Orleans. Um, and, you know, as we're sitting in this church, I say kind of, but by God's grace, we haven't, you know, uh, heard of a lot of severe illness uh, or death here in Atlanta, um, you know, recently. Um, but as we look at that modeling, right, in terms of increased temperature and that being one of the climate hazards that we will have to contend with, um, you know, the idea is, is for us to get in front of that um, with some solutions so that we don't experience, um, you know, deaths and a lot of severe illness as a result of the increasing temperature. Next slide. And so when we think about the populations that are vulnerable, just like with the air pollution, we're talking about similar, you know, um, similar uh, levels, uh, similar uh, vulnerable populations. So children, elderly, um, pregnant, folks who are pregnant, um, also very at risk. Um, and we've got to also think about, you know, low socioeconomic populations. Um, there are a lot of folks um, who live in Atlanta uh, in, in some of the surrounding areas who are living in some of the older housing stock who don't have central air conditioning. Um, and, and that's an issue. Um, I guess what compounds ish the issue, um, not only do you have kind of the, uh, the impact of um, you know, the health effects, you know, um, you know, those with asthma, those who already have some sort of respiratory illnesses are impacted. Um, but, but also um, kind of the double whammy is that in a lot of these neighborhoods where people are living in this older housing stock who don't have, you know, access to the air conditioning, et cetera, um, they're also uh, heavily energy burdened. Um, so they're paying a larger percentage of their household income on utilities. So even for those who have air conditioning, um, with those extreme temperatures, um, and in many cases, the energy inefficiency of their homes causes people to have to, you know, use that air conditioning, you know, on a consistent basis. So the price is going up, um, you know, for, um, you know, in terms of their household finances, you know, just to, to stay, um, you know, to stay cool. Um, so very important. Next slide. And I'm almost done here. Um, this is just kind of a smattering of some articles that have come out, you know, over the past year. Um, a couple which are focused on Atlanta. Um, one that talks about how Atlanta is even more sweltering in those neighborhoods um, due to, in, in, in these neighborhoods, due to a racist 20th, uh, 20th century policy, talking about the redlining. Um, another story that was in the New York Times that mainly focused on Richmond, Virginia, but also spotlighted this issue in other parts of the country um, in terms of kind of how decades of, you know, racist housing policies have left certain neighborhoods sweltering. Um, and um, just wanted to kind of share that this is something that is, you know, um, in the news quite a bit, especially during the warmer months. Next slide. And, you know, to kind of um, to, to begin toward my, my end, I just have maybe three more slides or something like that. Um, I didn't say before, and so I want to underscore that extreme heat um, is the leading cause of weather-related deaths in the United States. So this is above um, hurricanes and superstorms and some of those extreme weather events. Um, and so that's why it's so important for us to look at these urban heat islands, to look at the impact um, because of the way that extreme heat is impacting folks. Uh, next slide. Uh, we, I 
um, and co-lead of a project called Urban Heat ATL. Um, this was founded out of Spelman College, Georgia Tech, uh, and with community-based organizations like the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance and the City of Atlanta's Office of Resilience was at the table um, when we established this project. And we were working with students um, as well as community members from across metropolitan Atlanta, um, but with a heavy concentration of community members on the west side of Atlanta. Um, and we're tracking uh, temperature uh, changes across Atlanta neighborhoods. And we're using uh, in this, um, this a really small handheld uh, device, a temperature sensor, it's called a pocket lab. Um, and folks are using, um, powering up these pocket labs, connecting them to their um, smartphones and using them when they're walking through neighborhoods, when they're biking through neighborhoods. Um, and th we're able to detect some, you know, small, um, even the smallest, you know, changes were crossing neighborhood boundaries. This is really important. I think we're powering this through community science um, so that people can get involved, um, so that they can recognize what's happening in their communities, um, be a part of the data collection, but also be a part of developing the solutions. And I also think this is significant because for many Many of the other studies, including the ones that I've cited earlier tonight, they use satellites um, that are, you know, can only kind of look down in a certain, you know, kind of box almost, you know, in terms of how um, they are, you know, targeted, you know, toward, um, you know, the land surfaces. And so um, with our community science project, we're closer to the ground. Um, in these neighborhoods, crossing neighborhood boundaries, seeing where there is vegetation and where there isn't, um, and seeing those differences. Um, and we've seen, next slide, even in some cases, um, even, you know, 7 to 15 degree differences in certain parts of our community. We're still doing data collection, um, but that's pretty significant. Also, um, at Spelman, um, my colleagues and I um, had a one-day Atlanta heat uh, watch campaign. This was funded and supported by NOAA. And for one day, we did this last, uh, in 2021, Labor Day weekend, um, NOAA loaned us um, heat um, kind of research grade uh, temperature sensors that folks were able to mount to their vehicles and bikes um, to drive different routes of, and points of interest in Atlanta um, to look at what was happening. And so we've gotten that data back, and it's basically showed us what we what we knew or are believed to be the case. And so those areas that are most densely developed, um, many of the uh, red line areas and areas where you have um, heavy populations of communities of color, where you don't have trees, um, where you don't have a lot of investment in parks and green spaces is where um, we saw the hottest temperatures. Next slide. Um, one last thing um, is that as an offshoot of that project, um, I, I and, uh, and the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance are working with folks from the Lawrence Berkeley National Lab um, to do a kind of a heat resilience study. So we're concentrating our efforts in southwest Atlanta, looking at some of these areas that have been um, most impacted by extreme heat and where uh, we have interviewed uh, and had focus groups with residents this summer to understand how they experience extreme heat, what they do in their homes to try to protect themselves from these hotter temperatures. And part of the outcome will be to try to develop some strategies, low cost strategies for how we can, you know, cool those communities um, while we're also working to do um, larger scale things. Next slide. And I think, um, and so this is just gives you a sense of what we're doing. We've been assessing building stock. We've interviewed residents. And so next we'll be um, doing some energy audits for um, residents uh, in Southwest Atlanta and we'll be modeling what we can do from a passive, you know, low energy perspective to develop some cooling solutions. And again, the idea is that we need long-term strategies, but we also need some things to do in the short term. Um, next slide. And I think that's it. Um, so thank you for allowing me to share with you tonight. And do we have time for questions? Um, questions for Dr. Jelks? I, I have a few that I can I can start off with. But um, first of all, thank you. This is uh, amazing work, um, and it's interesting. I, I feel like professionally we should chat because I didn't know you were doing all of this, and this is this is just yeah wonderful. Um, yeah, you know I I think um, one of the questions that I have I, I think is related to sort of the both short and long term solutions. Um, you know I. 
There's a book by a sociologist about the Chicago heat wave in the 1990s, which was one of the most intense heat waves. I think from a death standpoint, certainly, I think it had the highest number of deaths of, of any heat wave, at least at the time. Um, and, you know, I think one of the findings was was basically that a lot of the people who died uh, were alone and did not have support networks. And so I, I guess I'm, I'm just curious from kind of a policy and community standpoint, like how can we, you know, what, what would you advocate that the city do um, to prevent that, that kind of thing so that everybody, you know, does have some support network that, you know, certainly wasn't in place in Chicago in the 90s and I think, you know, probably to some extent isn't in place right now in Atlanta. That's a good question. I don't, I don't know that I have the best answer, but what I would say um, is that I think the city should do, and this is something that um, years ago when the city actually did uh, develop a resilience plan, and I was on a special kind of working committee to help um, look at um, kind of responsiveness of the city. And so one thing that we really tried to impress upon folks at the city was that they should really invest in understanding kind of the networks and communities, um, you know, kind of who, who will community folks kind of connect with in these case, in these situations where there might be extreme weather events or some sort of, you know, natural disaster or emergency of some sort. Um, and the city, you know, they definitely have um, what they call, um, oh gosh, I've forgotten, um, these community emergency response team certs. Um, but they, they don't really engage. Um, and so spending some time developing those relationships and, you know, definitely city folks are at, you know, community meetings and neighborhood planning unit meetings and things like that, but investing in really understanding what that infrastructure and what the civic infrastructure looks like in communities, I think is going to be important. One thing that came out of the resilience studies that we've really felt like um, folks in communities are more connected to community than the city is. And so this idea of mutual aid, you know, kind of networks within neighborhoods might actually be more effective. But, you know, we need to bring the city along and they need to be, you know, a part of it as well. And I'll say in, in the context of uh, COVID and the pandemic, um, I know um, where the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance office is in Neighborhood Planning Unit S in Southwest Atlanta, um, the MPU got together um, and developed a um, kind of a, a program in which they reached out to and called like the seniors, you know, every week. So there was like this wellness check to see how folks were doing, if they needed anything. Um, we started organizing, you know, contactless deliveries of food that were being grown, you know, at our site. Um, and, and things like that. And so those types of networks, again, it was it was almost like community folks had a better finger on the pulse of what was happening, you know, with the seniors. And that's, you know, really at the micro scale, but how could we scale up something like that um, and use some city resources to help, you know, get the word out or to, you know, help strengthen those networks, maybe even to give resources to these community-based groups to, you know, do it themselves. Um, but, you know, off the top of my head, you know, that type of thing I think would be really important. When was what? Um, that, who that was 20, maybe 17, 2016, 17, something like that in terms of the resilience plan mm -hmm. around that time. And, and as far as mitigating heat kind of directly. Um, you, you know, I think you, you touched on a range of strategies. Do you see kind of one as maybe more promising, whether it's like green space or, you know, trying to maybe have a more equitable distribution of green space than we do in Atlanta currently? Or is it a, you know, focus on the housing or kind of an all of above, all of the above solution? I think it's contextual. Um, it, it's just going to depend on the different, you know, neighborhoods, different geographic locations that we're looking at. So in some places it might be, you know, investing more in trees, parks and green space. Um, in other places, and really probably in, in many of these places, you know, 
uh, increasing, you know, access to, to AC and, you know, increasing energy efficiency, you know, although we don't want to, um, you know, using the AC, right, is, you know, also driving climate change as well. Um, but if we had more of the natural cooling um, and less need, you know, for the air conditioning, you know, to run so consistently, you know, that would really be helpful. Um, also, from the short term, you know, from a, just an emergency response perspective, um, I think we need to better anticipate, um, you know, extreme events um, in terms of things like cooling centers. Maybe they should be geographically, you know, placed um, where the most vulnerable neighborhoods are. I know this summer or before the summer when we started getting those really high temperatures, um, the city of Atlanta, you know, opened up one, um, one cooling uh, shelter um, you know, it's kind of maybe sort of centrally located, but when you think about where people might be coming from, if we're talking about transit dependent, you know, populations, is having one location really going to do it? Um, and so we're hoping that some of this data that we're um, collecting and will be analyzing will just shed some light on what some... Um, you know, uh, location-specific solutions might be. But, you know, in places like DeKalb County, um, there were multiple, um, you know, uh, cooling shelters. And, you know, they um, repurposed, you know, other public spaces. You know, uh, people got free access to swimming pools. You know, libraries, you know, people could go to. There were multiple places. Um, so thinking about those types of things would be important as well. But the short of it is, I think, is contextual. Climate Central um, is a network that is um, trying to produce a lot of climate-centric data uh, for cities. They work a lot with journalists, um, and, you know, they, they work with, um, you know, government officials as well, but they are really trying to push um, accuracy in reporting about climate change issues. Um, and, you know, they oftentimes, in fact, I've sat on some panels that they've had um, you know, with uh, journalists from across the country, they, you know, produce reports, and so they'll, you know, talk about um, some of the research that's happening, uh, what some of the findings are, and really try to get that information out uh, to the writing community um, so that folks can, um, you know, have experts to talk to, but also have credible data to use uh, in their reporting. I think I was reading uh, The Uninhabitable Earth, and um, they brought up how heat is related to cognition, and like, I guess some of the most successful cities over, you know, the last 200 years, like, had this, like, sweet spot of, of what their weather was like, um, so I wonder if there's any thing that's being tracked with related to the heat maps and cognition or, you know, like, if I'm hot, I don't want to do anything. Like, I don't want to do intellectual work, for example. Right. You know? I don't know of anything. That doesn't mean that there isn't anything going on. I do know that there's some folks at UGA who are looking at some things that might um, kind of be borderline related to this. Um, but I haven't heard a lot. Um, I think it would be really interesting to do that. Interesting. I just got back from a Phoenix in August, and so I was looking at what they're doing around heat. Um, so they have some solutions. Well, they're testing out some things. So um, Arizona State is working with entities in the city to kind of test out different strategies. So one was kind of cool pavement, um, you know, lighter colored, you know, um, pavement that they are um, putting in different parts of the city. Um, cool roofs, um, you know, painting, you know, rooftops, you know, using shingles that are light, more lightly colored. Um, they've been, you know, planting trees in kind of these, um, so they call them cool corridors and places where um, they just don't have a lot of vegetation. Um, but they also have a researcher at ASU um, that is, um, has developed kind of a, almost like a robot type 
setup that has multiple sensors. And so one of the sensors is measuring heat intensity. Um, and they talked about, uh, you know, later on this year, doing some, not only doing uh, more measurements around heat intensity, and so that heat intensity is meant to uh, kind of model like what the, the what we would feel, you know, as a um, you know, as a human, you know, within the, the context of the heat. So, you know, it's one thing to measure what the surface temperature is or what the ambient temperature is, but that heat intensity is, is trying to kind of demonstrate what a person would feel, um, you know, how, how they experience that heat. And so they also talked about some sort of dummies that would help them to understand physiologically what people would go through. Um, as they experience um, the higher temperatures, they haven't, I don't think they've launched that yet, but that is, you know, kind of, uh, it's coming. Uh, so I thought that was really interesting to, you know, getting into questions around cognition or, um, you know, what other, whatever other, you know, physiological responses there might be. A little off your topic, but it helps. I think it might help motivate political action when you have good, um, good pictures to go with what's going on. And you know, heat's in a in a kind of a unfortunate position there compared to say, you know, you know, you know, forest fires. You know, fires burning down Paradise, California, or hurricane flattening Fort Myers Beach, floods, those, you know, you get you get some really striking pictures from that. Heat, you know, but you get somebody sweating. Or better not, not sweating. It's too bad. And I, you know, I, can't, I haven't got anything to offer. I think, I don't know if anyone's trying to think or if has any creative ideas on ways in which we could um, make it more more memorable, uh, you know, get people in the in the guts. So I'm sorry, I said I'm just lamenting about something we don't have rather than yeah, coming up with a solution. Invisible killer. So one thing that we're trying to do, and I don't have any good images to share right now, um, we're trying to do some data visualization. Still not as striking as you know when you see the fires and stuff like that. Um, but in that data visualization. Um, what we are centering on is trying to um, create like an interactive map um, that you could, you know, kind of roll across like a computer screen and see, you know, kind of the areas sort of light up in the red and orange, you know, that are hottest versus the areas that are, you know, cooler. Um, so that's part of the data that we're trying to put together. Um, still not necessarily as striking, but um, I'm hoping that the interactive nature of things is people, you know, roll across their neighborhood or whatever will, you know, uh, interest folks. Mm -hmm. Right, right. Right, yes. Mm -hmm. Exactly, exactly. Um, and we're hoping to just this element of people. Um, being a part of the data collection will help to raise some of that awareness as well. You know, when it's just the satellites and, you know, researchers who are doing their thing and, you know, they report about it, we listen or not listen, but when people are, you know, walking through, biking through their neighborhoods, they feel the difference. Uh, they begin, you know, they're, and you can look at it in real time, look at the peaks go up and, you know, that sort of thing. Um, we're hoping that that, you know, and it's kind of small scale, right, in terms of, um, you know, the folks that we're able to engage when you look at the entire, um, you know, metropolitan area. And we're really focusing in on the city of Atlanta in particular. But, you know, it's it's a starting point. Uh, it's an entry point. And I know that even in DeKalb County, 
Um, Commissioner Ted Terry is interested in kind of standing up a team and getting some resources to get the, some things going into CAB as well. So um, we'll see. Absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Um, oh, this one's very live. <laughs> um, uh, thinking about, like you mentioned, um, emergency response, and um, and and folks are um, thinking about like what what can be done at like a super micro level in DeKalb, um, uh, the CERT community and the emergency response team community are trying to think more about like the neighborhoods, like they're shifting to that, but they're like in the in the contemplation phase of that process. Mm -hmm. So they've had they've had warming centers. They actually had one last night. Did um, they? Yeah, Excellent. because of the freeze warning. So those are volunteer run, um, and uh, and so that's that's run by um, uh, the CERT folks and the the um, DeKalb County Fire Rescue Reserve folks. So they're the ones who show up at the fire station and hang out from 8 p.m. to 8 a.m. if there's anybody that shows up to do that. And they are moving to cooling because it's becoming more of a thing. And so they're mm -hmm. starting to wonder about that. So if you're if you're wondering about like um, boots on the ground, like where to plug in right now to get a sense of agency in the face of overwhelm, um, if you're if you're a night owl, um, you might be able to connect with DeKalb. Um, and also, uh, you mentioned like community neighborhood resources, like next door. In the last mm -hmm. since 2020 happened, like these, th those are mobilizing communities, but but they need the information, and then they need the connection, and they need us to kind of find the ways to plug in. And so, right. if you want to know more about cooling or warming centers, I'm happy to connect you with um, folks at DeKalb County Rescue Reserve and point you in their direction. They are they are not like the most efficient group. They are not the most connected group, but they are they are a lot of them are really really dedicated. So, um, and and they need they need help. So if you're you're feeling called. Um, here's your sign. So. Nice. Thank you for that. Yeah. Great question. Great question. So that is one of the areas that with our urban heat project we're hoping to tackle. So most of our data collection is, you know, with people using these handheld sensors, but we have a growing network of stationary sensors that are logging data 24 hours a day. And so that's where we will kind of pull um, this data around um, nighttime temperatures. Um, I also have some students who are interested in hopefully maybe next summer we will pilot some things where we might, you know, try to work with some community members and kind of understand what the temperatures are indoors and what they're experiencing and yeah, so the 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 sensor, the stationary sensor network is going to capture the outdoor temperature, and then we also, you know, want to look at what's happening, you know, indoors for folks as well, and, and then also understand from them, you know, what they are experiencing and feeling, you know, kind of physiologically and that sort of thing. It seems like they are. It definitely does seem like they are in terms of some of the. Um, projects that are getting support, you know, from the feds right now. But we'll see. Locally, I haven't heard about any particular outfit that is particularly poised to, you know, roll out something big. I know South Face in the past is... Right. Yep. A absolutely. Um, this is less related to your research on the heat islands, but, um, you know, one of the things that a lot of groups I'm in are trying to get everyone to get electrify everything, right? And so the thing that comes to mind is stovetops, you know. Is there any, and maybe you don't know, but is there any data between, like, how harmful having gas stoves are versus electric like over time or anything like that. Like, so I'd love to be like, oh, this is really, really bad, and just tell my friends that so they go get electric stoves. Mm -hmm. I just don't know if there's anything out there or not. I 
haven't seen much, um, but I haven't been looking for it um, either. I do know um, in terms of just some of the environmental justice groups that I follow, there's a group called We Act for Environmental Justice in uh, Harlem. Um, and I've seen some campaigns that they've had where they've kind of focused in on teaching people about the impacts of using, you know, gas stoves and how that, you know, can harm health. Um, but I haven't, you know, tried to dig into, you know, what um, scientific data they might be, you know, using um, to really, um, you know, develop those campaigns. But I definitely have seen that one group really, you know, kind of spotlight that issue. And that, that's really the only group I've seen say anything about that um, in the United States. Well, I guess last question, are there ways that we as a community can be involved in your, your research or your work? Is, is that, um, yeah, how, how can we be helpful? I guess are there ways that we can, we can get involved? So for any, if anybody happens to live in the city of Atlanta proper um, and you're interested in collecting data for Urban ATL, we'd love for that to happen. We are kind of in a pause phase right now because we're trying to get some back-end database stuff together. Um, but we'll be, you know, beginning to reach out and have more campaigns to get folks. Um, and really, you know, temperature collection year-round is, is good. Um, you know, there's probably more awareness, you know, when it's hotter, but uh, even in, you know, cooler months, um, it's good for us to get that type of data. So I, I'd say that would be, you know, one way. Um, and, you know, just kind of sharing, you know, this information, promoting, you know, sharing it with your neighbors. I'd say look out. I have no idea what the time frame is for the DeKalb project, but I know we're going to, um, we're, you know, working with uh, Ted Terry's office. We're also beginning to field um, inquiries from, you know, local schools that want to get involved. Um, so that um, is a, you know, just if you're engaged in any, you know, local schools, um, you know, getting them connected to these types of projects would be helpful. Um, you could always donate to organizations like the West Atlanta Watershed Alliance and even designate because um, Wawa is one of the community partners for Urban Heat ATL. You could, you know, designate um, that your support go toward, you know, this project or um, any other project. Um, so those are just a few ways um, that you can get involved. Great, thank you. Well, please join me in thanking Dr. Jelks for being here. Thank you. Can I say something? I wanted to share. I do have some copies. Um, this is a journal. It's called AFT Healthcare, but I wrote um, a piece on environmental justice, and it talks about heat. It talks about redlining. It talks about some of Atlanta's sewer system issues, and it talks about some of the community responses. So if anybody would like a copy um, of this, you can take it. Uh, if you um, pref if you're interested in it but prefer not to have a physical copy, um, I can give you my email address and I could email you a copy, you know, as well. Um, if you want to be, you know, lighter on on the resources, but it was already printed, so if you you know want um, want a copy of this, um, feel free to to grab one before you leave. Great, thank you. Uh, you know, I, I think one of the things that I I really appreciate about your work is is the way that it. Um, shows that climate is intersectional, uh, you know, that climate change is not just emissions, it's not just polar ice caps and polar bears, it is those things, but it's also people's health right here in Atlanta, um, and those health disparities fall unevenly across the city based on, you know, generations of historical policies and practices. So I, I really appreciate that, and, and I think, you know, kind of thinking forward about some of the next speakers that we have, um, you know, this, this sort of raises, uh, to me, I mean, one of the things that came to mind was um, Nathaniel Smith last week talked about the Public Service Commission as a point of, of engagement. Um, and it made me think about, you know, utilities have disconnection moratoria in times of heat, but they're not very good. Uh, often they're like 95 or 100 degrees before the utility can, you know, is legally prohibited from disconnecting you uh, from electricity. So just you know, kind of calls to mind like these avenues for engagement that I think we often don't think about that are really, really important. Um, and next week we're gonna talk about that specific avenue for engagement. So I think this follows like really well 
from what Nataki was talking about. Next week, we have Chandra Farley, who's the new sustainability director for the city of Atlanta, who's going to be talking about energy justice, specifically you know, energy costs and how those are borne unevenly by uh, people of color and low-income communities, particularly in Atlanta. Atlanta has one of the worst records in the country uh, when it comes to uneven energy bills uh, and high energy burdens. And so Chandra's going to be talking a lot about kind of that and then policies and practices that have led us there and that can move us away from there as well. So, uh, you know, just I think it really falls directly on, on the foundation that that you set, Nataki, and, and really, really appreciate you for being here. And um, and and if anyone is interested, uh, you are welcome to join us next week. Uh, like I said, Chandra Farley is going to be here talking about energy justice. We'll be here in this room at seven o'clock. So look forward to seeing you all there. Um, thanks again.